Welcome back to the Austin Meyer Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Meyer. I am a documentary filmmaker, National Geographic Explorer, and on this show, I interview documentarians about how they craft the stories they tell. Today, my guest is Jeff Orlowski, director of the newly released Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, which, as of this recording on September 17th, sits at number four on Netflix's charts in the U.S. This documentary drama hybrid explores the dangerous human impacts of social networking, with tech experts sounding the alarms on their own creations. The Social Dilemma is not Jeff Orlowski's first documentary that's making an impact. He previously served as director, producer, and cinematographer of the Sundance Award-winning and Academy Award shortlisted films Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral. He's a two-time Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, founder of the production company Exposure Labs, which I love this. It's a company that not only is producing these films, but also ties impact campaigns to the stories that he is creating. Exposure Labs won the 2016 Brit Doc Impact Award, recognizing documentaries that have made the biggest impact on society. In 2017, Orlowski was the recipient of the Champions of the Earth Award, the United Nations' top honor for spreading powerful environmental messages to a global audience. In this conversation, Jeff and I discuss where he got this idea to make The Social Dilemma, why his team decided to use the unique stylistic choices of dramatizations and animations, and then we dive into the process of taking a ton of disjointed interviews and then weaving them together to create one of the most talked about documentaries of the year hope you enjoy my conversation with Jeff Orlowski. Jeff Orlowski, thank you so much for joining the Austin Meyer podcast. It is great to see you over there in Boulder, Colorado. How is your, how's your morning going today? Uh, Morning. I had a, I had an interview with the UK at 7am. So I'm, I've been up for a bit already. So right on. Uh, So uh, the weather is cleared a bit. We have less smoke here than we have recently. Yeah, I know. It just, it's just starting to clear out here in the Bay area and it's just like, a reminder of, of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> how refreshing it is and how much it impacts your mood. So The Social Dilemma came out September 9th um, publicly. Um, first off, congratulations. That's a, just an incredible accomplishment to to create something like this and put it out in the world. What, what has been the most gratifying um, aspect since this came out to the world? Um, I think when people really get what we're trying to say and they offer their own distillation or it's like, hell yes. Like I would have written that summary like that, like that, mm. that's incredibly satisfying because we're, we're trying to tackle a really complex set of issues. We're talking about an entire industry, an entire business model. We're talking about a shifting information ecosystem, how the world sees itself, the information that it gets, um, implications on mental health like it really when we started working on this project it unraveled into so many different subject matters we Mm. easily thought it could have been a series i mean without doubt it could have been an eight-hour series um but we we really wanted to keep it into a singular film and i'm just really grateful when people are getting the intention the thinking the ideas and it crystallizes for them and and that they're having their own conversations they're sparking their own conversations around the issue and and that's the hope that's the goal right so yeah, let's dive, let's dive into that in terms of like yeah. the making of this film and, and the questions that started to be raised for you. So yeah. I guess, I guess we can jump off there by starting like what question was in your mind as a filmmaker that kind of gave you the energy that you need to say, like, I'm going to invest years of my life into yeah. going yeah. to do this. Yeah. Um, so my past projects um, were both on climate, chasing ice and chasing coral. And uh, I've always been, curious about the big issues facing humanity. Like what are the existential threats? Climate change has been that existential threat for the last decade for me. Like this is a huge, huge foundational problem. And a few years ago, I started hearing from a friend from Stanford that technology was an existential threat. And I was like, what are you talking about? I love Facebook. I use it all the time. Social media is awesome. All of our friends work there. And, And I started to hear uh, from Tristan and then verified through a number of others that the way this technology is designed is reshaping our society and not necessarily in all ways for the better. 
And it was such a new thought for me. I, I literally just remember being like, what are you talking about? Like, how is this possible? This doesn't make sense. Explain it more. Um, I talked to other people for, to confirm, is this accurate? Is it not? Is there truth to this? It doesn't make any sense. I spoke to friends who were high up executives at different tech companies. And some of them were like, you know, I was skeptical at first too, but then I thought about it more and he's onto something. And, and it was hearing that um, for a period of months that gave me um, just confirmation that there was something to explore here. I brought it back to my team, my producer, our impact team. I mean, it was months and months talking with them around like, is this worth doing? Does this make yeah. sense? I mean, our backgrounds in climate, this is a totally different story, we, but we have access to some really interesting people that are right. high up in these companies. And does this like, and, and so it was many months of going back and forth on, should we even tell the story? How would we tell the story? Is it going to be a bunch of, you know, privileged white guys sit down interviews, talking head interviews, and the whole film is just that? Like, is, is that going to be the filmmaking? And, and we wrestled with countless questions like this around what did we want to do and how do we want to tell it? Um, and ultimately, you know, after uh, having enough of these early preliminary conversations, um, we realized there, there's something really, really big here. Um, and we didn't know what form it was going to take. We didn't know what shape it was going to take. Um, but it was just this desire and this pursuit to explore. Mm. And I think, honestly, that's been, um, I feel like we, our team has been very, very blessed from a filmmaking perspective. We've always approached our projects independently. Um, at first, not by choice. At first, because that was the, we couldn't raise the money. Uh, we couldn't get <laughs> right. a distributor, couldn't, right? And so it was just begging and pleading and asking anybody we possibly could like can you help us and so the independent route was the only route that we knew of mm. um but the freedom and flexibility that comes with the independent route is something that i've really come to cherish um mm. both with chasing coral and with the social dilemma they took longer than we originally anticipated and it was because we were still exploring and we were still learning and the story was changing and then we had new creative ideas and you know, with Chasing Coral, we tried to film something and then we couldn't capture it and we needed to reinvent how we were going to try to capture it. And fortunately, we had, you know, investors and donors and supporters of the project that believed in our team and believed in the work. And and they were cool. It was just, yes, keep going. Like, right. like we know what we're trying to go for and it's, it's taking a little bit longer, but that's fine. And right. um, that flexibility has been so valuable uh, to me to give me the time and space to think and right. to try to spend years distilling a complicated issue into a single project. Totally. So, and, and on that distilling something really big into something that's digestible in yeah. a feature length yeah. film, when you go into saying, okay, I want to make a film about climate change, or I want to make a film about these social networks are you going in and saying, that's kind of the theme. Let's now start exploring and doing our own discovery process to see where we have unique access, where we have something something unique to add to this conversation that hasn't been told before, or do you like, or does the the unique angle come kind of at the outset? maybe in how it worked, either Chasing Ice, Chasing Crow, or, or on even this one? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I really think it's more the former. Like I look at, okay, so um, in the case of Chasing Coral, mm -hmm. um, uh, I got an email out of the blue one day from this guy, Richard Vivers, who was documenting oceans changing, like coral reefs changing. And he sent me these before after photos of a, here's a healthy reef and here's a dead reef. And he had seen Chasing Ice. He knew that we did time lapses of glaciers and he was suggesting like, there's something here. And I started meeting with him and talking with him. And I, I didn't know, I think this has always been a, a meaningful rubric for me personally. I feel like I'm pretty on top of news. I feel like I have a, you know, I would hope better than average understanding of news and global events. And if something is new to me, my hope is that it's going to be new to other people as well. And so I knew a lot about climate change, having spent five years making Chasing Ice and learning about glaciology and climate dynamics. And here was somebody telling me there's a climate change story happening in the ocean that nobody knows about. And I knew nothing about it. And so it, it led to this pursuit. It led to this curiosity. Okay, let's investigate. And 
we met with Richard. He connected us to scientists. We met with a bunch of scientists. We started learning about what was going on. And we didn't have a clear set at that point around like what the story was going to be. We just knew climate change is happening in the ocean. How do we talk about it? And it wasn't even climate change at the start. It was the oceans are changing because some people were talking about plastic in the ocean. People were talking about acidification. People were talking about um, dead zones. People were talking about dynamite fishing. And that first year was becoming a a pretty quick student of ocean issues and meeting as many people as we could and asking people like, what what are the big problems? Like, what are you seeing? What what are you trying to address? What are you worried about? And at the same time, we're asking the question, how can we make that visual? How can we visualize this? How can we give people a way to see it that works for the film medium? And uh, for Chasing Coral, it was a year of exploration and then we realized coral bleaching. This is one slice of this climate change pie where this small story can tell part of the big story and be a reflection of what's going on. And hopefully people can understand the cascade impact of you know, this keystone species and an ecosystem that is dying. Like we're literally losing the keystone species for right. the ocean, arguably, and right. um, we're trying to bring that to life. Um, so for me, it is it is a very exploratory phase. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I love this field so much because I just get to be a student. For mm-hmm. it's like, what do I want to learn about now? What's Amen. interesting? And okay, um, is this worth three years of my life? Is this going to intrigue me? Um, you know, and and uh, these the big issues that we are dealing with as a society, um, how can we shed light on it so we can hopefully improve and make them better? Mm. So when you worked at, when you started working on the social dilemma, did you envision that you would have a unique challenge in the way that you needed to create visuals for this? Because yeah, whether yeah. it's chasing ice and chasing coral, you got glaciers, you have yeah, exactly. coral reefs and beautiful yeah. oceans. Exactly. And now I, I imagine when you started out on this, you're thinking of like, the frontline documentaries that have those crude close-ups on, on like the fingers typing on the phone. Exactly. (laughs) It was, that was such a pain point at the beginning. It was like, okay, we've got a bunch of mostly, mostly white men. Um, And I say that in that, uh, you know, I have great affection for all the people in the film. Um, The industry, the tech industry that we are, you know, commenting on here in large part was built by a bunch of white men. I think the industry has been going through its own reckoning around its need for greater diversity and it's been making those shifts as well. Um, But certainly in the filmmaking, uh, in in the access that we had and the people who were willing to be on the record about this, um, it did skew towards a particular demographic. Um, And so as we're meeting them and talking through, I, I was just like, okay, we have a bunch of guys in front of their computers. Like, Right. How, what do we, what do we do? Like, how do we visualize this? Like, how do we make this? <laughs> interesting? Um, and so that's really what led to this um, exploration around how do we make this creative? What's a good creative challenge for us? How can we elevate in different ways? Um, it's something where we, uh, we always, we had these ideas for skits and vignettes. Like that's where it originally started. It was, um, the big short was an inspiration around, okay, you've got a complicated issue, but how do we bring it to life? We were kind of, at, at the start, we were thinking, what's the documentary version of the big short that can okay. flip that upside down? Right. And then um, Inside Out was a, a big inspiration around how they anthropomorphize the emotions in the brain. And these ideas just kind of came together and we ended up coming up with this concept for a narrative that flows throughout the whole movie um, that can visualize and bring to life the algorithms hiding on the other side of our screen. And right. uh, that, was a, that was a big breakthrough. Once I started thinking about that, like I couldn't shake the idea and we knew it was a huge creative gamble, but at the same time, like we had this huge challenge around getting people to think about and understand what a machine learning algorithm is in a way that people, like most people don't know, you know, they're not thinking about algorithms on a daily basis. Right. And Absolutely. it's a complicated word and it's a complicated concept. And how do we get them, how do we get the public to feel emotionally and resonate and understand um, the nuance of what we're trying to explain? Mm. And it was working for some of those dramatizations were kind of working for me on two levels. There was one where you have the the characters kind of at the switchboard. Right. For me, that was like this 
uh, a metaphor that allows me to grasp um, and in some sort of like kind of comedic way, exactly what is happening in these algorithms as for someone like me who doesn't think about algorithms and is not much of a techie, I, I found that useful and I felt myself in the last, you know, few days since I saw the movie, like actually seeing those little people in my own brain, like, oh, they're flicking me something right now. They're looking awesome. at how much I'm, I'm, I'm looking Great. at this photo. That was completely and then, the hope. <laughs> yeah. And then, and 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 doing so in a way where if you hadn't had that, like, I just wouldn't be conjuring that up in my head days later. And then the other dramatization with like the actual family story. One of the one of the things that that did for me, and I'd be curious to hear your reflection on this too, is mm -hmm. on a film like this, it seems like another challenge would be that you essentially just have this collage of information and no kind of driving narrative force of like, we're starting here and we're gonna watch someone change over time and arrive here, which is kind of the, right. the skeleton of a story. Right. Whereas right. since you had that dramatization, it gives it that kind of forward propulsion right. that may be lacking if it's just kind of like, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. Right, right, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm with you on both of those fronts. Uh, the, the, this concept really started originally as wanting to bring to life the algorithms. And I kept thinking, just as you said, like I, I was trying to wean myself off of Facebook and I started to get, um, I got sucked into their resurrection algorithm. I mean, there's a period in October. I just, I looked back at it recently, October and November of 2018, I was really fighting to get off of Facebook and Facebook was really fighting to keep me on. And <laughs> the emails and then the notifications and texts that were coming in and seeing like, okay, it's sending me a ping about somebody in the film industry. And then an old friend that I haven't spoken to in a long time. And like the variation of different, and this girl that I had a crush on in high school, right? And, and it's just trying and testing everything to see what's gonna get me to come back. And I started to feel the manipulative hand of the algorithm as I was trying to break myself free from the platform. Um, and so it was feeling that and experiencing that that I was like, we need to bring that to life. I want an audience member to feel that and to recognize that. And so they can hopefully identify it when you see it on these platforms. Um, uh, yeah. And, and those multiple layers, I, I think it really was um, an attempt to, uh, accomplish a lot of different things. Um, some ideas that we had in the interviews that we couldn't work in in the interviews, we tried to work those into the narratives. And then also just to make it accessible. I mean, I remember we were doing some test screenings. Um, even early, early on, we had storyboards for the narrative script. And we did test screenings and we had some young, like middle school kids um, in on those test screenings. And I could feel them glazing over when it started to get heavy in the talking heads and they're talking about manipulative business models and, you know, some 13 year olds were starting to fade. And then when it came to the narrative elements, like they were back in and there was a story that could keep them hooked. And I think this is, you know, one of the pros and cons of trying to make something for a very broad audience, but like those narrative elements worked really, really well for some people. And for some other people, I think they think it's oversimplified, but it's trying to bring a lot more people into the conversation in a, in a way that I think um, can be really effective. What, for you as a director, um, how did it feel differently directing yeah. those those dramatizations compared to the documentary work that you're, yeah. you know, yeah. more experienced with? I mean, um, so in, in college, uh, I was part of the Stanford Film Society, and that's where I first got my experience in filmmaking was on narrative films. And um, I did some short narratives that have gone to festivals, and uh, I haven't had as much experience directing actors, but the experience of directing films in general, you get more and more trained and attuned to your gut instinct and what you think is working and what's not working. And, and then uh, you're also used to working with um, uh, just real people that are living their daily lives. And you can also start to feel more and more like when you're capturing authentic moments versus when you know, somebody who's not used to being filmed and they sort of like change their behavior for the camera sometimes. And you're like, I can feel that and sense that like that doesn't work. Like I don't want that in the movie because it just doesn't feel authentic. And um, in, in the doc world, I feel like you often are 
I just find like if you keep filming more, just surround them with the camera more and more and more, it kind of desensitizes somebody to the camera and they forget its presence. Um, but in the narrative world, when you're working with actors, um, they're trained to just tap into that authentic real place. And there's, you know, there is this mindset that um, uh, all all filmmaking is nonfiction in some ways. Like all, you're documenting this real world experience of an actor embodying a particular role and how well can you do that and how well can they like live that, that story idea. Um, and so for me, the narrative stuff was extremely fun. Um, it was a, a time challenge. We had a really like absurdly ambitious schedule. Um, and so it was nonstop filming very, very late in our schedule to get all the Was that just going. dictated by budget or timeline to get a cutout or? Yeah, we were, we were pushing for a Sundance premiere and that timeline. Um, and we really just, uh, the, the Sundance timeline was one in part because we felt really strongly that the film needed to come out as soon as possible. And uh, looking at the, the calendar and the opportunities, we were really close to that schedule, but we had to work really, really hard to hit those timelines. Um, and so it was a, a crammed schedule. And then all the VFX had to happen like simultaneously while we were shooting. And one of the big challenges is as we were, as we were writing all of the narrative elements and building out the script, um, we were still editing the documentary and we would change some of the scenes in the documentary and realize, oh, wait, how is this going to plug into the narrative? We would change a conversation in the doc and it forced changes in the narrative film and then back and forth. So it was a constant, constant chicken and egg scenario between those two. Uh, but one of the really cool things, um, it's, I remember sharing a cut of the film with our, uh, with our cast, with our actors. And it was very cool for them because they got to see a finished movie basically before they even filmed. Like we had the documentary cut and we oh, had these narrative scenes storyboarded in and we had voiceover for those narrative scenes. And like, this is what happens here in this scene. Then this is what happens in this scene. And that's, and so our talent could watch the movie basically before they ever acted any of their parts and they could see wow. how it fit into the bigger picture. Um, so I think, I think for them, that was a pretty cool experience. Um, and then we were on set and I knew what the transitions needed to be. I knew we were coming out of this scene and we we're going into that scene um, in, from the documentary world. So the narrative stuff needs to flow into those and, and work like that. So that was extremely, extremely helpful. So did you do all your interviews um, and then kind of like transcribe all the interviews and just go paper script? Like, did you have a, a cork board? Did you, were you all on Google Docs? Like doing like, how did that work? Did you do, I'm sure you did a ton of interviews and. Yeah. So we did a ton of interviews. Many of them didn't make it into the final cut of the film. Um, that's really where we started um, both as, a learning process for myself and for our team um, to get my editing team and my writing team on board as well and to, to come together around like, what are we trying to say here? Like, what's, what are we finding? What are the themes? Um, you know, which interview subjects are providing new and fresh and interesting information? And, you know, what do we feel like we've already heard already? Or what, what are the points, right? So that really was a starting point is the background around, let's do all these interviews. Um, we had paper edits. We had uh, also just a lot of it from, you know, I love working with transcripts, but there's so much more that you get in actually watching the footage that sometimes right. isn't translated through a transcript or sometimes you see a body language uh, or position or um, there's a pause that is gold when you're watching the footage, but it doesn't come across on the transcript. So you're constantly working back and forth on both of those. We had a huge cork board with all these index cards with an attempt at some color coded system, which always failed. Um, <laughs> and then we, we used um, some like digital whiteboard software. Um, we were using mural, um, okay. a piece of software that allowed, uh, it's like a collaborative Google doc version of a dry erase board in some sense. So mm -hmm. we had like these post-its and we could work pros and cons on that technology. I mean, it's especially now in a COVID world, it's great because you could have a shared workspace. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me really appreciate large screens as well, because you get the real estate of being able to see a lot at the same time. Um, uh, working on some of that stuff on a small screen is like torture, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. we, we used a bunch of different platforms and it was constantly evolving. And these are some techniques that 
you know, we've, uh, we've used on different projects and it's, it's always like, but is this working for us right now? Does this make the most sense? What's the best tool for us right now? And I personally, I'm very comfortable and open to testing and trying different things out like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And just really the goal being getting the whole team on the same page with the same information. Um, And there were so many, so many structures. I mean, it was just a constant, here's one idea and then we have to change the structure completely. And what are we trying to say? And this is, there's so many different issues within this meta issue. So what's the order of like the personal harms and the societal harms. And we really did try to structure like, here's the problem in the business model. And this is how you see it unfolding at the personal level and kind of escalating toward the societal level. Yeah. One of the risks of, of, of tackling something like that, that within that issue has a bunch of other kind of like things you need to explore, whether it's like how this is impacting like global politics, how it's impacting like kids who are growing up with this, Um, like all those different kind of verticals within this issue. I think that there's a risk in films that I've seen before where the transitions are just, they're not fluid and it feels just like, We're talking about this. Okay, now we're going to jump to this. Now we're going to jump to this. And what I thought your film did really nicely is is those transitions seem smooth. Cool. And and it does that. Sometimes I felt like the the dramatization, kind of the the narrative story, was a way that you could kind of like make those kind of curves, (laughs) smooth transitions. is that, is that something that you thought about and, and does that happening in the writing? And yeah. yeah, completely. I think transitions for documentaries are some of the hardest things to pull off. Um, you know, for narrative film, if you're writing the screen, a screenplay, you get to write explicit transitions from scene to scene. Um, and that's inherent at the starting point for nonfiction. When you are um, working through different ideas, it's really hard to transition from one idea to another idea, as, as you're saying. Um, I think there are a couple different ways that you can address that and work on that. Um, first of all, as you're editing, we actually started this film thinking we might need chapters, like chapter one, the problem, chapter two, blah, blah, blah. And we had this structure that was set up around those ideas that at times literally had like a slate on the, on the screen and, you know, the number four and a topic header and change the conversation. Um, in some cases, uh, uh, well, we, we did think about that quite a bit. We were using then some quotes. We have a couple of quotes in the film that also serve as a transition. And as you're pointing out, these narrative right. elements that serve as transitions. And that was one of the really nice things about editing with these storyboards um, which was a, a really amazing privilege. Like we, we had, okay. So what do you mean by a, that? Editing with the have, storyboards. So let's say there was this narrative scene idea um, mm-hmm. and we had a script for it. We worked with the storyboard artist to sketch out what that scene was going to be. And we came up with 10 images and you can see here's the wide shot. Here's a close up. Here's the reverse angle. Here's blah, blah, blah. And we were cutting those in as if that was the actual final footage. And we could tell if it was a smooth transition or not, or how could we massage those transitions? You know, in some cases you find these lines in your interviews that are just gold. And it's like, this is a perfect transition. This sentence gets us from this problem to that problem. And they wrapped it up. And I think that's really some of the the strongest magic when in the edit room, you can identify these very specific lines that are these powerhouse lines that it's like, there's a period at the end of the sentence and it gives you this like hint of another idea. And that's the next idea we're going to go to. Um, mm. I, I personally, um, at least my process, what I've seen is I just really like a lot of editing time. Um, documentaries are made in the editing room. Um, I want as much time in the edit as possible. Um, I like doing test screenings with people. Uh, I just love watching people watch the movie and I don't even need to ask questions often. It's like, oh, Mm -hmm. that scene wasn't working at all. Like everybody was drifting. (laughs) You feel the energy. How how early, Uh, how early do you do test screenings? um, Once we get to a full cut. So um, we're working on the whole film. We've got a a written structure and storyboard. We're cutting all of that. It's a long and fat cut. You know, we're over two hours, two and a half hours, sometimes longer. 
And then usually we bring our internal team to watch together. And that's okay. usually the most painful moment in the whole process. It's like, God damn, like we have so <laughs> much work to do. How is this going to work? This is totally not going to work. Are we like going crazy? And like, that's, <laughs> That's the phase where um, I think we've, we've done this enough times now that I have embraced that that is the guaranteed reality of that phase and you're ripping the bandaid off and you can do it with a trusted team of your close right. collaborators and advisors and partners um, whose opinions you really trust. Um, and so you, you go through that phase and you watch it internally and you're like, all right, this is what we can do. And then we do that. We make all those changes. And then we usually do like a second screening internally as well. And it's a little bit less painful. It's like, all right, we fixed some problems, but then other problems got worse. And then um, we do that, you know, a couple of times. And then we're like, I think we're ready for feedback for more feedback because I, I, I don't like feedback when it's not an accurate reflection of what I want it to be. Mm. What do you mean by that? So like if I want it to look like, this thing over here, but it currently looks like this other thing over there. I don't need feedback on that right now because it's not close enough to what I intend that the feedback isn't valuable, right? Gotcha. Uh, because you might comment on things that I'm already trying to work on to bring it to what I want. Or you might comment on things that would actually take it down a different path. And I haven't yet communicated my ideas well enough that your feedback can take it down a different path. So I need to get it in the ballpark of what I want it to be before I find the feedback is valid and, and relevant. And then what we try to do is we try to get back from a bunch of different people, diverse perspectives, people who know the subject, people who don't know the subject, right? So I was screening it for people, for friends who work in the tech industry, and then I was screening it for kids who use social media or people who avoid social media. Like I wanted a diversity of opinions being voiced back. And many times, hopefully, I can hear um, the curiosities, the questions where people got hung up, what, they, what was unclear, or the critique or the pushback. Um, in, some, in some cases, we can address that pushback at the stage because, oh, you know what, we have that footage, or, oh, you know, we really do need to get another interview, and let's go find that person to answer those questions and to get that material in the film. Um, mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're at that right stage, you can get enough feedback that can help bring you in, in a better and better direction. Um, mm -hmm. And it really depends on, and from my perspective, it depends on like, are you trying to make something for a particular audience in mind or not, right? Some films might have a very specific audience in mind and other films might not. Um, but being aware of that, like what message are you hoping to communicate is an important part of that process. Um, for me, it is that, discovery phase of learning and coming up with my own thoughts and my own conclusions and my own thesis in some ways and trying to uh, articulate that thesis clearly. Um, right. For this film, it was a real, I mean, my goodness, there were so many different critiques of the tech industry that it was really, really hard to wrap around a single idea. And it took a long time, but we really did conclude like the biggest theme here is this attention extraction advertising business model where right. we have micro targeting gone rogue. And right. then it was really like, how do we keep the conversation to that? Because otherwise it's so easy to drift and go into a million other areas. Absolutely. And so you were kind of tweaking as you, as you went with all those feedback screenings. And then when I watched the film and saw the coronavirus section, I was like, okay, now they're also making changes post Sundance. Yeah. Um, did you make any other changes post Sundance other than other than the COVID thing? Because I imagine that was like a, that was a, big, a whole new curveball. Curve that was a big curveball, obviously. Right, that was a huge, huge curveball. We we were as I, as you know we said earlier, we were on such a tight timeline for Sundance um, that certain things got a little bit rushed. And when we were at Sundance, there were things that we still wanted to tweak, and it wasn't like huge stuff, but we wanted to work on that scene, that transition was a little rough. Do we really need that idea? The section's dragging a little bit. Let's change the end credits and the tone. And so they were, we, we had intention to open up the film after Sundance, which many films do, right? In, in many cases, actually we did this with Chasing Ice, Chasing Coral and The Social Dilemma. Like you do a bunch of test screenings, but your festival premiere is the first time you actually get to introduce it to the world. And you right. get a lot of people to see the movie and you get feedback and, 
and you still have this window before it's being fully, fully launched where it's like, well, we, we can fix some of these things. Like somebody brought up a really good point about this thing. Why don't we add that note in or remove this other thing that's unnecessary? Um, so we were planning on making those changes. We had opened the film up again in uh, like late February, March, and the virus was just starting to pick up. And we were now editing and realized, wait a second, like there's misinformation happening about this virus on these platforms that we're talking about and it perfectly ties in. And so we, we really actively worked to get as much information as we could very, very quickly and, and tie all of that in and, and to look at all the misinformation and conspiracy theories running rampant. So right. um, that is stuff that we were able to pull into the film and, and get out there. Um, and yeah, it was great to be able to insert that. Yeah. Amazing. Before I wrap up here with, with my last question, where, where can we send people to, to check out the film or any other places that we want to send them? Um, so the film is on Netflix. Um, it's called the social dilemma and our website is the social Um, and I'd strongly encourage people to go to the website. Our team has built out a whole slew of resources, um, a, a bunch of stuff that we were able to put together to try to help people. All right, now if you've seen the film, these are the ways you can have conversation with your family and your community. These are the ways that you can engage. This is, these are the ways that you can think about it. We're also hosting a whole bunch of panels um, to continue the conversation. So just this week, we hosted a panel. Um, we had over 3,000 people join in and Amazing. listen to the conversation live. Um, and so it was really, really great to go in depth and, and have these nuanced conversations about the issue. Uh, so we're hoping to have a lot more of that as well. We're really just trying to encourage conversation. Um, another great thing I would point people to is one of our subjects, Tristan, he has a podcast as well called Your Undivided Attention. And so great. he's doing a, a whole series of interviews. It's just much longer form, right? So many, many long interviews with a lot of really great experts um, that can help give insights into this whole um, reshaping of our information ecosystem. So there are loads and loads of resources out there, a bunch of our partners as well on our website. So uh, point people there. Well, that's, that's amazing. It's one of the things that I love most about documentaries is to see how people are tying impact campaigns and like using this as just the, the seed to get this conversation started. So for all those listening, I'm going to drop the links in the show description if you want to check out some of that stuff. So to wrap up the interview here, a question I like to, to end on always is by asking documentary filmmakers like yourself, if you have any last piece of advice for people who are either getting started in the industry or maybe they've been in the industry for a long time and um, are aspiring to make films that kind of have the impact that the ones that you've worked on, what would be a piece of advice you'd offer? Yeah, um, really great question. Um, Ira Glass, uh, who hosts the podcast This American Life for many years, there's a, a series of uh, short videos that he has on YouTube um, where he, he talks about I forget what it's exactly called. It's like tips on storytelling or something like that. But he says something in there that stuck with me really, really deeply. Um, and the basic gist of it is you have to do the work, right? There's a, there's a gap between you recognize that you have taste in a certain way and you know what you like and what you don't like. And you start making stuff and there's a gap between your stuff isn't landing at the level of your taste. And right. you have to keep, making more and more content and keep exercising those muscles until you recognize that it is hitting what you're hoping to accomplish and the taste. And it takes this process, right? It, it takes a long time. Um, it takes a long time to figure out your voice. I, I didn't even consider myself an artist until like the release of Chasing Ice, you know, and I'd made plenty of short films and I, I uh, spent countless hours at that point editing and it, like making Chasing Ice was my film school in many ways. And you just have to, the, the strongest I, advice I would have is keep making the work that you want to make and get it out there into the world and get feedback on it and then move on to the next project and continue to grow and to challenge yourself. Um, and hopefully you get to a point where you're making work that you're both really, really proud of and people are responding to in a, in a good way. And I do believe that that is an achievable goal for, for basically any creative that wants to go down this path. It can be really 
challenging creatively. It can be challenging financially. It can be challenging um, logistically, all sorts of different aspects. Um, but hopefully uh, you can figure out ways to pursue that and to dedicate your time and your heart and your resources to, to making that happen. Amazing advice. Jeff Orlowski, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks, Austin. That's it for episode 45 of the Austin Meyer podcast. Thank you to Jeff Orlowski for coming on the show and to you for listening. Again, I want to encourage everyone to go check out the socialdilemma.com because Jeff and his team have assembled some really great resources to take action. Uh, they have resources related to sparking conversation about the harms of exploitative tech. Exploitative? Exploitative? Exploitative. I'm going to go with that. Uh, resources for realigning. Oh man, I messed that one up. Resources for realigning your relationship with technology as a tool for connection and advocating for a more humane internet. And if you haven't seen the film yet, it's available today on Netflix. So thank you so much again for listening. I hope you got some value out of this conversation and I will see you next time on the Austin Meyer podcast. Until then, go out and tell some stories.